So first, I always begin every class at every level um, with a distinction between the general uh, framework or general orientation of two main approaches to economics. The orthodox neoclassical approach, which includes almost all economists today, and then the uh, non-orthodox or heterodox approaches. Um, so these are just the, uh, the view of the world that economists come to economics with. The uh, orthodox neoclassical approach begins with this view that there is a natural human nature. And that is that uh, humans want to maximize pleasure, we call it utility, uh, and avoid pain. That humans are naturally rational in a very specific sense, which is that they care about their own pleasure and pain, and do not care about the pleasure and pain of others. Okay? That is rational. They are self-seeking, maximizing their own pleasure. Third, the analysis begins with the individual. And uh, I don't know the Italian macro texts, but uh, all of the English macro texts actually explicitly begin with individuals maximizing utility through time. Okay? So even macroeconomics begins with the individual. Um, they assume rationality, and then the belief is that if you get the incentives right, free markets work. And they work in a very specific sense, that is, they drive toward equilibrium. Okay? And equilibrium has a very specific sense in uh, macroeconomics. It is a vector of prices that clear all markets. Um, there is a very small role for the government to play in the economy according to this view. Because for most things we can let the invisible hand of the market operate. <laughs> the role for the government is to um, provide some things that markets don't provide very well that markets don't provide enough of. And examples uh, that are usually given are the policing, the military, some public goods that are not uh, sufficiently supplied by private markets. But the general view is that we have far too much government. What we need to do is to reduce the role of the government in the economy let the market work. So in the United States, uh, this uh, uh, view really became dominant in the post-war period with President Reagan. I know that uh, none of you were alive during the years of President Reagan, uh, or Thatcher in England. This made a huge difference in society, um, where the, the argument was that the, the, we need to get the government off the backs of the people, we need to greatly reduce the role of the economy, and uh, Reagan was a Republican, a right-wing Republican, but this is also true for the more left uh, Democrat uh, candidates. President Clinton said virtually the same thing, that we need to reduce welfare and um, let, uh, provide the proper incentives so that people will want to go work instead of just sitting back and collecting welfare. Okay. Uh, so we've had the gradual rise of what we call neoconservative in the U.S. and in Europe we usually call them neoliberals. Uh, George Bush called it the ownership society. I'll talk more about these when we get to the global financial crisis uh, later in the course. Finally, there is a, a specific definition of economics that's given in the textbooks, I assume in yours too that um, really uh, summarizes very well this approach to economics. 
Economics is defined as the study of the allocation of scarce resources among unlimited wants. And so I've underlined the important words here that really distinguish this approach to economics from the non-orthodox approach to economics. Okay, first, it's about allocating resources. You notice the word is not production of resources. The rigorous neoclassical theories actually don't even have production in them. It's all about exchange. Exchanging an endowment that you inherited. The theory actually doesn't explain where the endowment came from. You have an endowment of resources. We allow you to exchange in free markets. You have something that you don't want, but someone else has something you do want. You exchange. The market determines a vector of relative prices, okay, which clear all the markets. So demand equals supply. It's not really about produ producing resources. It's about allocating them. Second, the resources are scarce. Okay? If resources aren't scarce, um, the market cannot price them. So scarcity is essential. Resources must be scarce in order to have prices. The market can't do its job if resources aren't scarce. And finally, wants are unlimited. Okay? It's true that there's a diminishing marginal utility. Okay? You drink more and more beer. Okay? Eventually, the utility you get from drinking beer declines. But wants in general are unlimited. And this creates what's always called the economic problem, which it used to be the, the title of the very first chapter of every economics textbook. What's the economic problem? Wants are unlimited, resources are scarce. That means nobody can be fully satisfied. It's impossible. And this is why economics is called the dismal science. Because we have to explain to people they cannot have what they want. Economics is all about explaining to people why they can't have what they want. Resources are scarce, wants are unlimited. Okay? So this framework lies behind the economic theorizing of virtually all economists. Okay? There is a second approach. It has a long history, but... Oh, sorry. <laughs> the final thing. With marginal productivity, the argument is you can't get everything you want, but you get what you deserve. Marginal productivity theory says that people contribute to production, and then they receive back according to how much they contributed to production. And therefore, you get what you deserve. Okay. Sorry, can I make a question? Yep. But uh, the resources for the neoclassical and um, the marginal productivity theory, it means even for the money? Well, the rig <laughs> there is a problem here. Okay. The rigorous theories have no production and no money. When we start adding production, things get a little fuzzier. When we add money, they get very fuzzy. Because in a rigorous, general equilibrium model, there is no room for money. So Hahn, Frank Hahn, one of the most famous developers of the GE theory, said the problem is we can't find a reason to have money in our models. Okay. Just yep. uh, the most rigorous uh, is uh, the intertemporal general equilibrium approach of our own group. Yeah. In, in that case, actually you don't need money because there is full certainty. Actually in the first period of the economy, you have the time in all the horizons. The part of the economy, supply and demand, there is no certainty, no reason to, to store uh, money as a reserve and so on. When you go on further and further in economics, you, you will do the Aero de Bro model, and um, you will find out, it's sort of surprising, that there is no money in the rigorous models. Now, that doesn't mean that people who adopt the orthodox neoclassical approach say nothing about money. They write a lot about money. Okay? The problem is they really can't explain why money is used if the economy operated in the way that the rigorous theory states.
So they come up with ad hoc reasons for using money. All right. Um, so it is a bit of a problem in their theory. Why is it that in the real world money is used? Now, if they just said, well, we, we have no room for money in our model, therefore we're not going to talk about it, who would listen to them? Okay. No policymakers, because in the real world we use money. In the real world we do have production. Okay? So you have to be able to say something about that. So they do address it even though they admit they haven't come across a good explanation for why money exists. So it's, a, it's an ad hoc a, approach to policy making. They have a lot to say about money, okay, and we'll do a little bit of it today and then more of it tomorrow uh, on the role that money plays in the economy.